Right. Good morning, good afternoon, and for some of you, good evening. Welcome. It is our pleasure to welcome the viewers from across the globe to our final session of the Modus Academy Summary Webinar Series. My name is Taya Hamilton, and with me I have Sarah Lim. We will be our host for today's session, and we've saved one of the best topics until last. Today we'll be discussing neuromodulation, and in particular the research and applications of transcranial magnetic stimulation, or also known as TMS. Thank you, Taya. I'm so excited to be hosting with you today as we hear from three different professionals and your perspectives on TMS. So I believe we do have clinician, researcher, and industry representation today. All right, well, without further delay, we'll welcome our speakers. And joining us on our panel today, we have Dr. Brenton Hordaker and Dr. Mark Cortez and Mrs. Kate Lapp. So we will introduce each of our speakers in more detail before each of their presentations. But as a reminder, we'll leave the Q&A to the end. So please type any questions into the Q&A box and we'll try our very best to get our speakers to answer them live. So first up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brenton Hordaker. So he's a senior lecturer in physiotherapy, neuroscience and rehabilitation at the University of South Australia. Back in 2014, Brenton obtained his Doctor of Philosophy in Gait and Mobility Function at the Flinders University before moving on to serve in, as the Plasticity Theme Leader of IMPACT, as well as the Chair of the Australian Physiotherapy Association and the Neuro Neurology Group, as well as the future leader of the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence and Stroke Recovery Group. So Brenton is involved in research, both as researcher himself, but also as a mentor, having produced numerous peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, uh, while supervising others. His research result roles around neuroplasticity, brain stimulation, and the nervous system. So I'll hand it over to you, Brenton. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Taya. I'll just share my screen. Just give me a minute. Okay, hopefully that's all good. You can see, see the screen okay? Yep, good. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we do, uh, both research, but also at the end, a little bit of clinical stuff that we do around brain stimulation for stroke recovery. Uh, I'll primarily cover two key studies, um, and they cover some different themes because we, we can do different things with brain stimulation. So the first one is really understanding stroke recovery. Um, so we use, as Taya introduced, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a non-invasive method of activating um, neurons in the cortex using an electromagnetic pulse. Um, and you can see here coils held over the, the surface of the head, a, a pulse discharges and it induces an electric current within the brain. Um, and if you position that coil in the right spot, so over say a motor area of the brain, you can actually get an evoked response. Um, and it's actually really important because it tells us, first of all, for someone who's had a stroke, that that pathway is still functioning and intact. Uh, and that's actually a really good biomarker for whether someone's likely to recover uh, upper limb function after stroke. So we have some studies going at the moment where um, we're using that equipment in the hospital setting to, you know, within one to three days of stroke, we'll test whether that motor pathway is still intact after that stroke. And then at three months, we'll, we'll check up on patients and just see if that was a good prediction of recovery. Um, we can also understand some of the mechanisms um, for recovery and also uh, look at things, you know, if we do therapy, how does the brain respond? So does it change excitability of those pathways um, when we do our therapy? Probably the other thing that really interests people is how we can use it to enhance recovery. And that's when you start to get into uh, like the high frequency repetitive pulses. So for example, we use uh, repetitive TMS or theta burst stimulation, which is a pattern form of stimulation, very high frequencies lots of repeated activation of those synapses. And when you do that, you start to induce um, short-term changes that, that last beyond the period of stimulation. Uh, and that's basically, um, they think, based on pharmacological studies, uh, underpinned by synaptic plasticity. Okay, but there's a lot of questions. So, uh, I mean, we've got a very nice picture of a brain here, but what happens when someone's actually had a stroke, for example? So you can see, this is actually one of our patients um, who we'll come back to at the end of the, uh, the short presentation. And there's damage uh, in, in that, that cortex, in the motor area uh, of this person's brain. So if we stimulate the brain there as a therapy to enhance recovery, what actually happens? Does it still work if there's not as many neurons 
Um, there's not as many connections available. Is it the same for everybody? And then also, does it matter when you do this sort of therapy after stroke? So is it better to do it early after stroke when we know much of the recovery happens? But there's also physiological changes that happen in the brain early after strokes, and perhaps it's better to wait until more chronic phases. So there's a lot of questions that we still don't know, and we'll unpack a little bit of that as we go. Um, before I get too far into it, I thought I'd just go over some really key concepts without knowing um, who's listening in today. So the first one is that when we talk about neuromodulation and the ability to facilitate recovery, we're talking about plasticity. And with TMS, I mentioned about synaptic plasticity. So it changes in the efficiency of those synapses when we stimulate them. Um, a key thing is that the capacity for plasticity or the, the mechanism of plasticity is actually available throughout life. So it doesn't matter whether you're you know, one day old or whether you're 100 years old, everyone's brain actually still has the capacity to undergo neural changes in plasticity. But we do know that that capacity for plasticity changes during critical periods. So if we think about developmental stages, so a baby learning to walk for the first time, um, there's a lot of changes in, that, in terms of their uh, anatomy, in terms of you know, strength, bones, et cetera. But of course, there's lots of changes happening in the brain and they're actually fairly rapid. So you think about a baby learning to walk for the first time. Uh, so a, a lot of learning happens during that period. But we also know that after stroke, so, um, so after injury, for example, so say stroke, there does seem to be a change in the capacity for plasticity. And we know that from animal models um, where, where we can actually you know, look at slices of the brain. We also know that neuroplasticity is fundamental for learning. <clears throat> and if we think about stroke recovery, um, the ability for the brain to change is actually fundamental for restoring some of that lost function after stroke. So what we were really interested in exploring was does this same period of heightened plasticity occur after stroke in humans? So we don't actually, prior to this, actually have any physiological evidence that there was an increase in capacity for neuroplasticity early after stroke. And then equally, how long does that period last? Because if the period was actually able to last several months, that would suggest that therapy delivered during that time was really critical and that delivering as much therapy as possible within there would help facilitate recovery. What we, did, what we did know prior to the study was that behavioural data certainly suggested that much of the recovery after stroke happens within the first probably three months after stroke. Um, and we also know from animal models that there was um, a, an increase in the capacity for plasticity. And broadly speaking, it, it seems to open at about five days after stroke. And that window for enhanced plasticity would stay open till about 14 days. So it's very short term in animal models from basically one to two weeks. So what we did do, we actually ran a um, parallel group study. So we collected some data on the Ipsy lesional hemisphere. This is us using the TMS coil on the, the stroke affected hemisphere. And that was here at the Royal Adelaide Hospital in South Australia. Uh, we did some repeated assessments um, for patients over, over basically a year. But four of those assessments, so half of the assessments actually happened all within the first month. So they're at one, two, three, and four weeks after stroke. And then the other four assessments were at two months, three months, six months, and 12 months after stroke. And we weighted it towards that very early period after stroke because we knew from animal models and behavioral data that if there was a window for plasticity being uh, enhanced or upregulated, that it's probably around that very early period after stroke. What we also knew was that the contralesional hemisphere, so the non-stroke hemisphere is actually still important for recovery. And there's a lot of changes that happen in that hemisphere after stroke as well. Um, so we were working with um, some colleagues over at the University College um, of London, uh, so John Rothwell and his team over there, and we collected data uh, at four different assessment time points. So from memory, because I didn't collect that data, I think it was around two weeks, two, four, six, and then 26 weeks after stroke. Okay. Uh, and this is a published study, as I mentioned, so it's available um, if you want to download it or you can email me afterwards. So how do we assess plasticity? Because that's um, a little bit confusing in itself. So what we did was actually, broadly speaking, we perturbed the brain using a, a, a plasticity protocol. And then we measured the magnitude of that change when we perturbed the brain. So we use something called continuous theta burst stimulation. So high frequency pulses, 600 pulses to be precise within a couple of minutes, okay? We applied that to the motor cortex and we actually applied it to the hand area of the motor cortex. And we had some electrodes um, on the hands 
of the muscle that we're interested in. So we could confirm we're in the right spot, but also we can get some measurements about what's happening to that part of the brain. So when we apply continuous data burst stimulation, it's actually a protocol that suppresses brain activity. So it's known as a long-term depression-like synaptic plasticity. So we, we should be looking for a decrease in excitability within that brain area. So we can measure the effect of continuous data burst stimulation using MEPs, which is just a single TMS pulse, and we're looking at excitability of the pathway. So what you can see here is that the first spike is the TMS pulse happening. And then after that, we get a, um, a, a, an MEP, a motor evoked potential, about 20 milliseconds after the TMS pulse. Okay, with continuous data burst stimulation, I mentioned that it's a decrease in excitability. So what we should see is something like this, where the MEP gets smaller after the stimulation. So the, the hypothesis was that if there was a window where the brain had a greater capacity for plasticity, that magnitude of MEP suppression would be greater. Okay. So what did we find? So in the Ipsy lesional hemisphere, we actually didn't see a change in that CTBS response. And I can answer questions about that later, but it's possibly related to the type of plasticity we looked at being long-term depression, so a suppressive form of stimulation. And generally speaking, we know that in the Ipsy lesional hemisphere, excitability increases. So it might be that the, um, the plasticity is actually biased towards a long-term potentiation, which we didn't measure in this study. But what we did find in the contralesional hemisphere was uh, statistically speaking, a time point by session interaction, which was significant. But if I show you this figure here, we have MEPs uh, on the y-axis and then our times that we've measured um, the plasticity assessment. And I mentioned that we're looking for a decrease in activity. And you can see the biggest decrease happened quite early after stroke. So within that, that window that happens around two weeks after stroke, and then the response has actually dissipated over time. So like the animal models, it does seem that there is an increase in capacity for plasticity early after stroke and that it actually dissipates with time after stroke. So what we think we found is we are able to demonstrate a time limited window of post-stroke cortical plasticity in humans. And if I really wanted to describe it in very basic terms, I think of it this way. So we have someone who's, you know, healthy adult, Broadly speaking, this is their ability or their function, but then a stroke happens. So a stroke happens at this time point and there's a decrease in their capacity to move or will use their arms, for example. We know that over time, certainly within the first three months, there's a lot of recovery. And in fact, the literature kind of says you recover about 70% of your lost abilities. So what we're thinking we're seeing at the moment is that probably this behavioral change is explained by the neuroplasticity that happens after stroke. So we've all got this capacity for plasticity, but for some reason after strokes, or after an injury, it seems to peak or increase in its ability uh, for brain changes to occur. And that rapidly dissipates over time as well. So a couple of really interesting things. So the first one is, you know, this is a really critical time early after stroke. So what can we do? You know, do we need to deliver more therapy at this time? Is there something we can do to accelerate the recovery even longer, perhaps prolong this period of enhanced plasticity? The other interesting thing is what do we do at say this chronic stage? So several months, maybe three months after stroke, six months after stroke. Is there something we can do to perhaps reopen a window of enhanced plasticity? So that's led us to the second bit, which is using brain stimulation um, as a way to facilitate recovery this time. So we were understanding the brain before, now we're gonna use it to facilitate some changes. Uh, and we ran a study um, not that long ago looking at neuromodulation um, with, with a different type of stimulation. It's called transcranial direct current stimulation. And we use that for a particular reason in that we could actually use these little handheld devices. And patients, we could train them and their carers um, in how to use it. It's just a sim single button, everything's pre-programmed. They'd go home, they place the electrodes and the, the pads and everything on their head. We would actually uh, zoom them so we could, this is me on the zoom. <laughs> Uh, we can actually see that they've set it up correctly and they would do the actual brain stimulation at home. So it works really well with you know, everything that's been happening in the world over the last um, couple of years. And the good thing was it was easier for patients. So being we're in Australia, we're very, um, everyone lives very far away from each other. It's a big country. We actually were able to recruit patients from rural settings. So several hours from our clinic here in the city um, and they could come and participate in these studies, but then go home, do all the therapy at home, be in contact with us and, um, at each session um, and then 
hopefully benefit from the study. So 51 chronic stroke survivors. So we were very purposeful in actually looking at chronic stroke. So we're outside that window of enhanced plasticity, okay? 14 sessions, so two weeks. So that's the other advantage, doing it at home. We're not limited by working days. That We had people do it for seven days a week. And they did something called a nodal TDCS, so to increase excitability um, of the brain, followed by um, doing some upper limb exercises. So people were randomised to the sham group and the, the active treatment group. And you can see here we've got time points that we did some assessments. And this is the Fugelmeyer, which is an assessment of upper limb impairment. And this is the change score on the y-axis. So higher up is an improvement um, in that upper limb. Okay. So at baseline, um, obviously no change yet at baseline. And you can see in the sham group, after the two weeks of brain stimulation, there was about a one point increase, which is nothing, you know, that exciting. It's probably a reflection of their outside of that window of enhanced plasticity. So yes, they did do 14 hours of therapy over two weeks, but it's not enough therapy to, to see a meaningful change. And nothing really happens, you know, at the one month and three month assessments. But in the active group, so those that got the real stimulation, you know, there's a significant difference in terms of the amount of recovery that they were able to demonstrate. But the really interesting thing for us is that it continued. So we have about a four point increase after TDCS, a five point increase at one month. So they've done nothing between uh, finishing the TDCS sessions and then coming back a month later or even three months later. And you can see at three months, they've actually achieved a clinically meaningful improvement in their upper limb impairment, and they've actually continued to improve. When we looked at their MRI scans as well, you can see this is, this is just the active treatment group, and this is a group level summary. Okay, so some activation in the motor cortices. This is a resting motor network, by the way, um, and lots of other scattered activation. And then this is post-treatment, so much bigger activation within that motor network, which is what we would expect. So it lines up very nicely with the behavioral data. But the key thing here, yes, the active group seemed to benefit, but not everybody had the same response. Some people really got a, a huge increase and some people were just a little increase in their, their abilities. So that's led us on to publish a, um, a theoretical model in how we might actually use some biomarkers or information about patient characteristics to tailor therapy to each person. So that's, that's available in neurology or I can send it through if you'd like. Um, but I just wanted to flag that because this is my last slide. I'm just coming back to our patient. This is the MRI scan that I showed earlier. So yes, we do certainly research in stroke recovery and we, we use brain stimulation in a lot of areas such as motor recovery and depression as well. Um, but we also run a clinic and we're, our purpose there is that when we test and evaluate things, if they're proven beneficial, we offer them back to the community. Okay, so this is a patient who did participate in some of those studies that I showed earlier her MRI scan here. Okay, so you can see a lot of damage in that motor area. So if we actually have a look at her diffusion or tractography stuff, you can see there's decrease in certainly in those purpley color descending pathways coming from that motor cortex. And if you don't believe me, I'll just pair it back a little bit more. Okay, and you can see very nicely here, a very nice corticospinal tract coming down from motor areas of the brain. So if I was to stimulate this side of her head, the, the non-stroke, we get a, easily get a response in her peripheral muscle. When I put TMS here, I don't actually get a response. This is somebody who that pathway is not functionally and structurally intact anymore. So if we go back to our theoretical model that we developed, we said that it might not be best to stimulate this area of the brain. And instead in someone like this, we might look at other parts um, of the brain as a target. So for her, we actually stimulate the non-stroke hemisphere. And just a bit of background about this patient before I show the video. Prior to coming in, she, had, um, she wasn't able to actively achieve full elbow extension, very limited shoulder flexion and extension. So a lot of proximal upper limb limitations. Okay, and what we do know about the proximal upper limb is it's actually bilaterally innervated, or certainly more than the distal upper limb. So there's a couple of reasons. So in terms of her anatomy in the brain, we thought it's best to look at the contralational hemisphere, but also her impairments being more um, proximal upper limb we know that there's bilateral innovation there. So we did, we do uh, still currently actually applying stimulation um, to the contralesional hemisphere. And we're working very much on her, her proximal upper limb. And we actually use the, the M2 from Fourier to do that. Um, 
which is, I'll play the video here, and you'll be able to see she's actively driving this. This is not um, assisted by the robotic device in any way, but her elbow, look at, in particular, her postural control when she's doing it, because she maintains great posture. I'll play the video for you. She's very aware of her body, okay? So she doesn't compensate by any of her movements. We trained her very well to look, you can see some nice shoulder abduction, she's getting into nearly full extension. And I can tell you actually now she does get full elbow extension, but this is someone actively driving it, okay? Doing it herself. She verbally tells us that she really likes working with the robotic because it's sort of, it is a bit more fun than me telling her to reach forward. Um, so she actually <laughs> comes away after these sessions sweating. So we, I saw her yesterday um, and she, you know, physically was very worn out after spending about 15 to 20 minutes doing that sort of exercise. So we, we, in this case, what we're doing is really combining what we know about her anatomy, what we know about stroke recovery. We're using our evidence that we've developed um, in brain stimulation for stroke recovery and then getting lots of training in. So we stimulate the brain, we sort of uh, prime the brain for therapy and then we deliver the therapy afterwards. Okay, I've probably spoken far too long, but just a couple of acknowledgements and that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Hardaker, for sharing your inspiring projects on TMS applications, especially on plasticity, and also combining TMS with other rehabilitation technology. It's really refreshing to see uh, the combination of you know, multiple um, technologies together. And then next up, uh, we have Mrs. Kate Lapp. So she is the Director of Neuroscience for Nextim, a Finnish-based medical device company specializing in non-invasive brain mapping and neuromodulation using navigated transcranial magnetic stimulation. So Kate has over 17 years of experience with neuro-related technologies, collaborating between clinicians and industry teams, both from the hospital and product development side. So Kate studied physics and electrical engineering, followed by fellowships at the National Institutes of Health and the University of San Francisco, uh, the, de the Department of Neurosurgery there. Uh, Kate has a passion for neurotech and aims to advance the standard of care through the integration of functional neuroimaging, clinical neurophysiology, and image-guided technologies. And when not working, Kate enjoys spending time training her puppy and going on road trip adventures with her family. So over to you, Kate. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that nice introduction. And if you give me one moment, I'll share my screen. And you can let me know and you can see that. Yes? Yep. Okay, so good morning, everybody, or good evening, whatever time zone you happen to be in. I'm very happy to be here to share some of the latest advances in my field, which is Navigated TMS. Now, as I said, I do work for Nextim. So the work I'm gonna to present to you is not of my own, it's of our clinicians and our researchers. So today I'm going to talk about um, one clinical use of TMS, which is pre-surgical motor mapping. Now I do realize that um, you came to watch a webinar on neuromodulation, but I wanted to start with this because it's often the first step in a lot of neuromodulation applications, including the two that I'm going to talk about today. So one of those is going to be the treatment of post-surgical paresis, and the other is the treatment of incomplete spinal cord injury. So first we have that clinical use, which is preoperative motor mapping with NTMS, and we do have an FDA clearance for this. So brain mapping, what is that? That's where we're trying to figure out what type of function is being controlled by different parts of the brain. And we can use that map as a guide during neurosurgery to help prevent resection of critical structures. Or we can use that brain map to help define targets for neuromodulation um, applications, like we'll talk about in a, a minute. So if you look at this MRI on the left, here we have an example of a 28 year old with a brain tumor that appears to be in the area of the brain that controls motor function. Now, without more information, the surgeon will not know whether it's safe to operate or whether this should be deemed an inoperable tumor. If you look on the right, and this is a 3D rendering of that same patient's brain, um, but this time you can see the Nextim and TMS data overlaid. So each of these bright spots means that that area of the brain was stimulated with TMS 
and it generated what's called a motor evoked potential or MEP. And I will talk about motor evoked potentials a few times today. Basically um, an MEP is a mini muscle contraction that you can detect with EMG electrodes over the, the muscles themselves. So each of these bright spots that you see means that that area of the brain controls some specific muscle group. And these gray pins that you see, that means that no motor evoked potential was generated. So no function was detected and it's just it may be safe to resect. So what they learned from this was that as this tumor grew, instead of infiltrating the functional tissue, it actually split the motor cortex and it displaced the area that controls, if I can get my cursor back, it displaces the area that controls hand and arm and face laterally, and it pushes the area that controls the lower limb medially. So based on these results, they deemed that this patient was a candidate for surgery. They brought this map into the OR with them, and they launched it onto the surgical navigation system so that they would know when to slow down and be more careful. They were able to resect this entire tumor and the patient did not have any post-operative deficits. So I wish we could have really great stories like this all of the time, but what we learned is that even if you use the very best brain mapping tools to avoid resection of the eloquent tissue itself, well, if you have a blood vessel that's perfusing this functional tissue and that blood vessel gets resected or compromised in some way, either during surgery or after surgery, you can still see post-operative deficits. So we have a team out in Germany at the Technical University of Munich who wanted to see if they could do something about these patients who are suffering from post-operative deficits. So this team noticed a couple of things. One, based off of a 2013 study by Gems et al., they recognized that if you're using brain mapping to avoid resection of the critical structures themselves, then 70% of the time you're seeing post-operative paresis, it's a result of ischemia. The second thing that they noticed was that the type of ischemia that they're seeing in their surgical patients is characteristically very similar to patients that were enrolled in some of these RTMS for stroke studies that had particularly positive outcomes. So they launched this study that you see on the screen and they piggybacked off of some of the research um, done in RTMS for stroke. Before I get into their study, I wanna detail the methodology behind their work because it's not necessarily very intuitive. So I pulled some images here from an old stroke study by Cater et, et al. Now if you look on the left side of this image, you can clearly see a lesion. And these red hotspots highlight the hand motor cortex of the lesion and the healthy side. Now, the basic principle behind stroke is that the brain gets out of balance. So as the neurons start to get affected by stroke, the healthy side actually um, tries to compensate and take on some of the workload. And the healthy side actually sends these inhibitory signals over to the lesion side. So what we end up seeing is too much excitability on the healthy side and not enough excitability on the lesion side. The idea behind this type of NTMS protocol is that you can actually stimulate the contralational side, so the healthy side, using this one hertz inhibitory stimulation. And the idea behind this is that you're trying to inhibit the inhibitory crosstalk. So downregulation of this healthy hemisphere ends up leading to upregulation of the lesion hemisphere. And the goal of NTMS then is to get the brain back into a balanced state. So here we have that 2021 paper by Eli et al. out of TU Munich. To be very clear, this is not an FDA cleared application. So they ran a randomized double-blinded champ control trial. They were enrolling patients suffering from post-surgical paresis after a glioma resection. They randomized patients two to one, either to active or sham stimulation. And after surgery, they gave their patients a post-operative NTMS motor mapping. So very similar to the one that you saw earlier. They then um, did 15 minutes of inhibitory one hertz TMS 
for the sham stimulation. And they followed that with 30 minutes of task-oriented physical therapy. They started these treatments one day after surgery and they continued for seven consecutive days. And they did their outcome assessments prior to treatment and then on the final day of treatment, so day seven, and then when the patient came back for their three month follow-up. And so this is how they did. As you can see, the average response in the active group was an increase of 31.9 points on the Fugelmeyer, and that's compared to a change of 4.2 points for the control group. And the other assessments that they did showed a similar trend. Now, in this study, a patient that showed an increase of 10 points on the Fugelmeyer was considered a responder. And 10 points can look very different for each patient, especially depending on their starting impairment level. So to give you an idea of what 10 points can mean for a patient, I went into some data we have from an old stroke clinical trial that Nexton did. And I found an individual who had a change in nine points. I couldn't find anybody who had a perfect change in 10 points, but just as one representative example, this individual went from a score of 16 and they ended up at 25. So prior to treatment, um, they would have struggled to open a door through extension of their arm. And after that nine point increase, they would have been able to um, use their phone, use a doorknob, and they were even capable of tying their shoelaces. So 10 points gives back a lot of function and a lot of independence. And the fact that this study showed that NTM has led to an average increase of 31.9 points is very impressive. The study originally planned to enroll 39 patients, um, but during the interim analysis, they were comparing the two groups and the level of statistical power was high enough that they actually met the early stopping criteria for efficacy. So they stopped this study early to publish the results. Um, and that was after they enrolled 22 patients. So obviously this small sample size is a limitation, but we are looking to run a larger study to try to replicate these results at another hospital. Now I'd like to show you another example of how TMS is being used in the rehab world, this time for incomplete chronic spinal cord injury patients. Again, this is not an FDA cleared application. Dr. Anastasia Shulka out of the Helsinki University Central Hospital used this technique called Paired Associative Stimulation or PAS. And it combines TMS with Peripheral Nerve Stimulation or PNS. The basic principle behind this is that neurons that fire together, wire together. And just to sum up that quote that you see on the screen by neuroscientist Donald Hebb, the idea is that you want to try to stimulate the, um, or activate, the upper and the lower motor neurons simultaneously to try to induce this reparative plasticity in the spinal cord in between. So on the left here, we can see their setup. Here's the next stim system delivering the TMS pulses. And if you look closely, you can see the TMS targets here. On the left, we have the system delivering the peripheral nerve stimulation. And at the bottom, we can see the placement for their PNS leads. These are just two options, but there's many al um, alternatives you can choose from. And in the back, we have one more workstation, and that's managing the timing of these two sets of pulses as they get synchronized. So the goal here is to get the orthodromic volleys from the TMS and the antidromic volleys from the PNS to collide at the level of the spinal cord. And this team show that if you can do this properly, then you can achieve long-term potentiation. And that manifests itself as an increase in the amplitude of the MEP after this treatment session is over. Typically, they're looking at that 30 minutes and 60 minutes after the treatment session is done. So this is just a, a small talk, and I don't have enough time to go into the parameters or the results of this study, which was really wonderful and important. Um, but what I want to do with the last am amount of time that I have with you is to show you some patient videos so that you can actually see how this change in long-term potentiation manifests itself um, as very 
meaningful levels of recovery for these patients. So this first individual is seven and a half years after their spinal cord injury, this is prior to treatment, and they're trying to spread their fingers. Here they are after 10 days of treatment. And you can see they have much better range of motion, much better control. And we have that same patient prior to treatment, and they're attempting to straighten their fingers. And here they are after 10 days of treatment, working to straighten their fingers. I have one more video for you. This is a different patient. This gentleman is one year after his thoracic spinal cord injury. You're seeing him prior to treatment right now. And prior to treatment, he was not able to walk without weight support. And here he is after treatment. So actually after three months of the paired associative stimulation, he had improved enough that he was actually able to qualify for the rehab program, which was really important for this individual. Prior to treatment, he was not eligible for rehab at all. So after the nine months of rehab, he came back in for one more round of the paired associative stimulation treatment. And that's where you see him now. Now he can walk at home independently 50% of the time with a walker. And as you're about to see, he can actually transfer himself independently between a bed and his walker. All right, so this group is in the middle of a larger randomized double-blinded sham controlled trial and they're enrolling 20 tetraplegic and 20 paraplegic patients. And so we do look forward to those results when they become available. Just to sum up here very quickly, Nexstim and TMS is able to offer very personalized patient care, but also in a very standardized way so that we can replicate these studies and see similar results at different hospitals, which is very important. Now, most importantly, I just want to remind you that those two rehab studies that I presented today are not FDA cleared. So in the United States, those are for investigational use only. But please feel free to in, um, email info at nextim.com if you'd like to learn more about the regulatory clearances in your own country. Thank you, Kate, so much Kate. for sharing those really inspiring clinical case studies um, and also highlighting the clinical applications of uh, navigated TMS for brain surgery and, of course, the therapeutic roles for spinal cord injury. It was uh, really fascinating, so thank you again. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Cortes has been unable to join us this morning, so the good uh, news is that we'll jump straight into the Q&A. We have um, the opportunity now to discuss a little more with our speakers, Dr. Hordeka and, and Kate as well. Yeah, so thank you again to you know both our speakers for sharing your insights and your wisdom, and thank you to our audience you know for your attention and patience. So we are now open to questions, and I've already seen quite a few in the Q and A box below. So keep them coming. All right, so we might start off with a really fantastic question here from um, Dr. Minup. So he, this is for you, Brenton. He said, a uh, great sharing of your work. I would like to know if there's other technology or intervention apart from the robotic device that you demonstrated there that's being combined uh, with TMS for stroke recovery. Um, yeah, absolutely. As the shortest answer, I, we our clinic is focused a bit more on technology use. Um, and I think there's some, there's a couple of key reasons for that in that generally we find patients enjoy it more. <laughs> Um, but we still have, and we were actually a teaching facility as well. So we have physiotherapy students who work in that same clinic. So we want to expose them to the, you know, the, the new up and coming things that are, are coming out in their profession that they're training for. But we also get them to do traditional therapy. Um, but certainly in the literature and, and what I know of clinical work out there, um, there's plenty of studies where there's brain stimulation combined with traditional physiotherapies. Um, we've done studies, the home-based TDCS study that I spoke about, that was using the, the GRASP, which is um, a home-based traditional therapy program. 
Um, we, in our clinic, we certainly use the robotic devices, virtual reality. Um, we have a couple of tablet based games. One's called the Fit Me, um, some other computer based gaming things, and then traditional therapies as well. Um, in, in my opinion, um, and this is certainly open to debate, uh, but in my opinion, what we're doing with brain stimulation is uh, increasing the brain's plasticity. So what's actually critical is not just the brain stimulation, it's what you do with that increased plasticity. So at the end of the day, your therapy is just as important as it ever was. So if your brain's got this new ability to learn and to you know, form new connections, you wanna do that in a functionally relevant, behaviorally important manner. So whether you do that with traditional training or robotics um, is totally up to you. With that patient that I showed, we chose robotics because the, the way the M2 works um, for us anyway is, is certainly uh, a lot more of the proximal upper limb control. And that's the level that she was at. And then that's the reason that we showed the video. Thank you so much, Brenton. Um, and I think the next question will probably be for Kate. So somebody asked, you know, how did the post-surgical paresis study differ from the next in stroke study? Yep, that's a great question. I mentioned that Nexon had done a stroke study in the past, and I actually know a lot about that stroke study because I actually managed it <laughs> um, a few years ago. So just to give you a little bit of background, Nexon ran two phase three clinical trials to evaluate the use of RTMS for the treatment of chronic stroke patients. We ended up having an average response rate of 60% in the active group and 50% in the control group. And unfortunately, we just didn't have that separation we needed. So we were not able to get FDA clearance for chronic stroke. That being said, there are quite a few differences between those different studies, um, the surgical paresis and the, the phase three clinical trial. So one difference is with regard to the protocol. Lots of subtle differences, but maybe the biggest difference was that in the surgery study, those surgical patients were treated for seven consecutive days. And then in the um, stroke study, they had 18 treatment sessions, but it was spread out over six weeks and they ended up going three times per week. So there was a little bit more downtime in between those um, treatments. So that it could have been a factor. Um, I think the patient profiles is where you see the biggest difference. So obviously with this stroke study, you're looking at the acute phase. And then in our stroke clinical trial, it was a chronic phase. So we were enrolling patients who were three to 12 months post-stroke. Um, another difference is that all of these surgical patients were suffering from ischemia. But in our stroke clinical trial, we had a mix. We had both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke patients. Finally, the location of the lesion was very different between the two. So in the, um, the surgery study, all of them had subcortical ischemia. And then in our stroke clinical trial, it was really nonspecific with regard to location. As long as they presented with unilateral paresis of the upper extremity, we enrolled them regardless of where the lesion was. And we had a, a pretty big variety. We had patients with um, cortical and subcortical, but we also had brainstem lesions and we also had cerebellar lesions. So I think that there's you no know, combination of multiple factors that really could have led to the difference in outcomes between those two studies. Thank you, Kate. I think that answers a few of the questions actually um, that have been brought to the Q&A box. I think everyone was really curious about those protocol differences um, that you outlined. So thank you for your really comprehensive answer there. Um, I think I might switch to something a little bit more for the both of you perhaps to, to uh, address. So um, we have one asking if TMS seems to work um, or a statement that TMS obviously seems to work for stimulating the brain in populations such as stroke, um, but they were asking if TMS could also work on improving sports performance by stimulating healthy brain or increasing the neural connectivity for 
um, better performance or set and, and better skill um, yeah development. So I'll uh, I'll let you uh, one of you answer maybe Brenton first and, and then Kate maybe you can follow up. Um, so my immediate answer is it's not my area of research, but I'll speak about what I do know on the topic. Um, yes, it probably does have some benefit. Um, it, I, again, I think it's got to be combined with training that's relevant to the task that you're talking about. Um, where, where I'm getting this answer from um, is a little bit different to the question in that we at our university do quite a bit of work with the military. Um, and I know that they're very interested in using brain stimulation as a technique in obviously healthy people, um, but to improve their ability to learn different tasks um, and, and improve their cognition and cognitive, you know, cognitive function as well. So it's not just a motor thing, it's a, a, a cognitive thing. Um, so the, the military is certainly looking at it. I think there's some evidence there to suggest that it works. Um, probably a slightly different answer again is that there's, um, you can Google uh, quite a bit of information on this, but there's a lot of people using it for gaming type things. So you can uh, apparently, I haven't tried this, you can buy devices online or make them yourself to stimulate your brain to improve your capacity with gaming. Um, so it's probably working on things like reaction times, uh, your cognitive function as well. So not my area of knowledge, but um, I, I suspect the answer is yes, it would be of some benefit. Yeah, I don't have much to add. And based off of the research that we're seeing, it seems you know, highly probable that you can use TMS to prime the brain before you train. So like you had just said, you probably need to combine the use of some type of neuromodulation with some type of training activity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if people will end up using TMS for, for sports per se, but I, based off of the research with um, stroke and, and um, motor um, improvement, I definitely think that it, it's technically possible. Probably the other thing I would throw in as well is some of our research has shown that cardiovascular exercise in itself um, increases the brain's neuroplasticity. So if we're talking about sports people, they're probably doing a lot of cardiovascular exercise. So um, I, I kind of agree with what Kate said. I'm, I'm not sure that it would necessarily be taken up in sports. I think um, yeah, that's just my opinion. Okay, thanks Kate, thanks Brenton. Um, so I think that, that there is an, also an extension of that question that's being asked more so for the stroke um, because TMS is widely used on applicable to the stroke patients. So does TMS actually help with specificity management in any way? And if so, what are the mechanisms? Um, so there are certainly studies that do look at TMS for spasticity. Um, the mechanisms are, I'm not sure <laughs> often with any of this that the mechanisms are fully understood. My understanding from looking at some of the studies that have done the area, uh, done this work in the area is that they can often target different brain regions. So it might be the cerebellum that they actually stimulate. Um, and it might also be the motor cortex. At a very basic understanding, um, I would say spasticity's, um, you know, the physiology behind it is a, a, a difference or imbalance between that inhibitory and facilitatory um, control. And we know that theta burst stimulation, RTMS protocol, so that, that neuromodulation certainly can um, change the level of inhibition in the brain. So it might be working at, um, you know, reducing that descending inhibition down to the spinal cord. Um, again, not my field that I work in, but certainly just reading around that area. And Kate, did you have anything further to add on that one? I think it was a I don't have anything <laughs> further to add on that one. Um, I know that it's it's usually a measure that is brought up in a lot of the studies, but sometimes it's overshadowed by some of the other performance outcomes. So yeah. um, I don't actually know the answer to that. But no, I think it was a, a definitely a very challenging one. So thank you, Brenton, for addressing it. But and we again, we have another question that I think segues quite nicely from that one. Um, the question is, what do you think of the accelerated RTMS protocol? So i.e. the multiple TMS treatments per day versus once per day um, in terms of more plasticity now, moving away from spasticity, but, but again, I'm thinking about the RTMS protocols. Yeah. Um... Do you want to go for this one, Kate? Or I mean, I can if you want to. Or 
Yeah, um, I was looking for it in the in the Q and A. Oh, there it is. Oh, right so I'm really excited about these accelerated protocols. Um, I think nobody knows why um, these initial studies have had such dramatically positive results, um, but there's a lot of people very excited to try it. Um, people are trying it for all different types of conditions. Um, and so we're gonna have to wait to see what those results show. Um, but there's you know, a, a lot of different reasons why it could potentially work. You know, if you have less downtime between each treatment, your, your brain doesn't relax back to that original state. You kind of keep it pinned into one state and it kind of forces the rest of the, the brain to rebalance itself um, to get into that state. But, but we don't really know um, if that's right or, or why it's working. But the, the studies out of Stanford in psychiatry, and they're using the accelerated RTMS protocol, um, had very exciting preliminary results. So like I said, there's a lot of studies that are currently underway, um, but we do have to wait for those results to see if it is um, effective. I think the only thing, a couple of things I would add are, like with any sort of training, when we, if I'm thinking about stroke recovery, more dose is better. So it does not surprise me that if we're talking about additional sessions or more frequent sessions, that it may be better. Um, the, probably my only word of caution around that would be in stroke, I'm talking about only. Um, we're obviously dealing with people that are neurologically compromised um, and there is risk that they are at increased risk of seizure. So if we're increasing brain activity and we're doing that multiple times in the day, um, what's the seizure risk? Having said that, TMS and TDCS is very safe. We've been, you know, thousands of experiments never had an adverse event. Um, and there's some really good international guidelines on how to screen people for brain stimulation safety. Um, I, I think um, one other thing I've noticed is we did a, a study, we are still doing studies around post-stroke depression. So again, stroke patients. Um, and one thing we know is that they suffer from fatigue. And it's really interesting that with depression, all we're doing is sort of about 35 minutes of brain stimulation. They're not doing any physical training for the depression treatment, but it amazes me how many patients go away from that totally fatigued. So it's, um, you know, I, I do wonder about doing multiple sessions, like two sessions a day, if, how that would go with someone who suffers from fatigue after stroke, because it's, it's almost like they're getting a, a brain workout from the brain stimulation and it's just tiring them out. Um, even to the point where we've had patients, you know, sort of hinting that they might actually pull out of the study because the fatigue is so bad, even though they're noticing benefits. Um, so I personally, at the moment, I'd, in, a, in the population that we work with, I wouldn't necessarily go to the accelerator protocols, um, but it may work in other groups that aren't neurologically compromised. Thanks, Brenton. That really answered my question because I had it in mind when I read this question, I was thinking, so what are the other like side effects from TMS? And if, as you've mentioned, if you do it multiple times a day, it's the fatigue levels that we're struggling with the patients. But are there any other known like side effects um, besides obviously, like you mentioned, increased risk seizures? Yeah, um, I mean, we follow the international guidelines. There's like a very, very well formulated, I think it's 15, 16 questions or something like that. Um, that we use to inform whether someone's safe. It's, I would say it's actually very conservative. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of as I was speaking, we, we haven't had any adverse events apart from mild headaches after stimulation, which is reasonably common, particularly for longer periods of stimulation. So that's sort of half an hour with um, say 10 Hertz RTMS. Um, you can get certainly pins and needles and tingling from direct current stimulation. And that's just a because of the form of stimulation in that it's, you know, it's like electric current, whereas TMS is a, um, an alternating magnetic field. So we don't perceive anything apart from like a tapping on the surface of the head. Um, but yeah, certainly um, headaches, bit of drowsiness, fatigue, um, and fatigue possibly is because I'm dealing with people with stroke as well, I suspect. Thanks, Brenton. Again, very comprehensive answer. And I think um, 
the uh, next one was predominantly for, for Kate. Um, so I'll switch to about the navigation for neuromodulation, Kate, if you're using um, EMG. So do, do you need that um, navigation um, if you're using the EMG to define your targets? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, we get that pretty often um, from people who are not familiar with navigation and just how much it adds. Um, they just get used to using only EMG. So what tends to happen um, when somebody is looking for a target in the motor cortex is that they do what some people call motor hunting. Um, basically, they will turn my camera's way up here. So the, the brain and the stimulator. So they're stimulating around and they keep doing that until they get an EMG response. And after the first few pulses, if they don't get a response, then they may just assume that that patient needs a higher level of stimulation. So they start going up on the stimulation intensity and they'll keep stimulating until they find a response and they keep going up on the intensity. But what happens as they're going up on the stimulation intensity is that the volume of the stimulating electric field starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger as that intensity goes up. And so it is very easy that what can happen is that you can be stimulating, but you can be one gyrus off or two or three. You can be pretty far away, but if you've increased that intensity, you can actually elicit a motor response from pretty far away from the motor cortex, just because you've increased the stimulation intensity. So generally speaking for TMS, the risk of adverse effects for TMS increases with an increase in intensity. So for neuromodulation, like they're asking, it's kind of like a double whammy, right? Um, it means that you could have this greater risk of a treatment effect on an unintended target because you may be stimulating pretty far away. And it also means that you could have an increased risk of adverse effects for that individual. Thanks, Kate. I think that question definitely also leads to another um, similar question. So could either of you comment on the variability of response to TMS stimulation and how to predict the responders to the stimulation? Um, so, so obviously what Kate said is uh, an excellent answer in that neuronavigation would certainly help um, confirm that you're in the correct spot, but also staying in the correct spot when you're delivering the treatment. So if it's a half an hour of RTMS, it's very um, easy for someone's head to sort of move under the coil. And if you don't have that neuronavigation, um, that you, you don't know you're delivering the stimulation to the correct, spons, uh, correct spot. The other thing I'd say to that answer though is there's a lot of things that affect um, someone's response to TMS, but equally they often are things that affect neuroplasticity in general. So um, if there's a great paper by Mike Ridding and Ulf Zeman, I think it was in 2010 in Journal of Physiology, uh, and they went through all the determinants at, at known at that time. So it's 2010 is a little while ago now, um, but all the determinants known that influence the response to brain stimulation. Um, Mike, I worked with Mike Ridding quite a bit and, and our group at the time was doing a lot of work around factors that influence response to brain stimulation. Um, and there are a lot, but they're all very minor contributions. Um, and then building on that work, I suppose, um, our paper in neurology published, I think it was last year, um, focused around those factors that influence the variability to neuromodulation. And we looked at TDCS in stroke. So we started to bring in things around, you know, the time after stroke. So what's happening with the physiology. So we know there's that increase in plasticity. So what happens if you try to increase plasticity even more when it's spontaneously increased? Um, and we also talked about some of the structural things. So if the, the descending corticospinal tract is completely destroyed, it appears from the literature that um, targeting that hemisphere doesn't work um, as well. So there's um, uh, you know, some, some really great sort of advances on that traditional model of that. So, so Kate kind of touched on it, that imbalance between hemispheres and excitability that holds true uh, in terms of the model of applying stimulation when that descending corticospinal tract intact. But when it's not, that model may not be as accurate. So again, it's, it's going back to another factor that influences outcomes is really the neuroanatomy and the, um, the differences from one stroke affected brain to another. 
Um, so there's a lot of things. Um, I think that story itself is a long way off from being fully understood. Um, and then another factor on top of that is really, we don't know what's the best brain stimulation protocol to induce plasticity. I mean, someone raised the question before about accelerated protocols. It seems like they do better, but what happens if we accelerate the accelerated protocols or we, we apply different frequencies or different number of pulses? And um, there's a lot of things I think that will probably change and be evaluated um, you know, over the coming years. Yeah, thank you, Brenton. Yeah, that's a, all really valid points. Um, and I think we've got still a lot of work to do in this field. Um, you know, I think generally, not just in neuromodulation and TMS, but still determining what is that uh, real, you know, the sweet spot for, for dosage and intensity to optimize outcomes. So um, we're just going to finish up for now that we're kind of uh, short on time. But one really important question, I think, to round out today's discussion is about you know, perhaps a limited integration and adoption of TMS um, into the clinical setting for either diagnostic um, or therapeutic purposes. And um, maybe you could both comment briefly on what you feel is the main limiting factor for that um, at this time. Um, do you want to go first, Kate? Um, honestly, I think that the biggest limitation is education and outreach. Um, sometimes um, we get in front of potential new users and, and they get actually upset because they didn't realize that this technology actually exists. Um, there are studies out there who have, you know, they've, they've put children through surgery without being able to do brain mapping beforehand. And they say, well, let's just see what happens. Let's see if they're resilient. But they didn't know that this technology was available, that preoperative mapping that's non-invasive um, is available to pediatrics. So I think that education and outreach is a big factor. Um, and then it's really exciting when these new users, they find out they can do this, they get in there, they have all these ideas for research and then they do it. Um, and there's so much excitement, there's so much motivation and fire to get all of these studies going. Um, and then there's you know another roadblock that hits. And that is with regard to market access. Um, each country, not every country has to do it individually, but um, for the most part, you need to try to get into each country individually. And it's a long pathway. There's a regulatory pathway and a reimbursement pathway, and it takes years. It gets so exciting to see these new uses with the device and you want to go out and help all of the patients in the world. Um, but from a manufacturer standpoint, we just can't, right? We have to do it very methodically, very carefully. We have to evaluate these new uses um, for safety and efficacy. And it's one of the hardest parts of my job is that you see that there are these patients who need help and you've seen that your, your device is potentially able to help them um, and you just can't. And we do have a few of these new um, potential new uses right now. And it's very exciting. Um, the research is all kind of pouring out, um, but then it's very frustrating because we can't help people fast enough. Um, that's a great answer. <laughs> um, well, I guess the only thing I would really add to that is, I, I agree that education is probably one of the biggest barriers to clinical uptake. And what we're doing to sort of get around that problem is um, we, we're running a study about predicting stroke recovery. So we use TMS within about three days of stroke. We have the, um, the stimulator on the stroke ward in our acute hospital. Um, we, we will screen patients um, based on the PrEP algorithm. So the PrEP algorithm is something developed by Kathy Stenier's group in Auckland. It stands for predicting recovery potential. Um, really simple. It's a manual muscle test. It's the NIST score, which is the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, um, and their age. And then in some people, we use TMS to see if that pathway is still intact. So simple that the only thing the hospital doesn't routinely collect in that is the TMS measure. So that's where I've placed the machine there. In about one third of patients, I seem to have to use the TMS machine. And what I'm hoping to show um, the clinicians there is that this is actually valuable. So that I could tell you, because we know the PrEP algorithm is pretty accurate. It was developed in New Zealand, so we have to sort of see if it's still accurate here in Australia, but we're, we're almost the same New Zealand and Australia. Um, 
So I would be very surprised if it's not accurate, but you know, we can basically tell someone at three days what their upper limb would recover like at three months. We can't do it at the moment because we're just testing to see if it is accurate. But the interesting thing is when we ask the patients, you know, if this works, would you want to know? About 95% of them say yes, they'd want to know what their arm is going to recover like. It helps them plan for the future. You know, what what's my rehab pathway going to look like? Am I going to be able to get back to work? So I think we're working at that education aspect in that study because it, part of me thinks I kind of know it's going to work. But what I want to show is to the clinicians that it's so simple that you're already doing 95% or not 95, but probably 75% of the prep as part of your routine care. And you just need a little bit more with the TMS machine and the training to do it. Um, I think the other aspect we work on being a university, a teaching facility, um, our, our clinic that I showed before with the M2 and the brain stimulation, we're trying to show um, students that come through in our, in our physiotherapy course that there are new technologies out there that can help with recovery, whether that's stroke or MS, Parkinson's. Um, so if the patient's suitable, we encourage the students to look at what's the evidence for brain stimulation in that population. If you think it's beneficial, do you want to try it? Now, there's some advantages for us because we don't have to worry about the reimbursement side of things. Being a university and a teaching facility, um, we if, if a patient can't pay, they pay zero dollars to receive that therapy. If they can pay, they have some sort of support. In, in Australia, we have quite a good um, healthcare system that provides support for people with disability. Um, they The most they would ever pay is $20 for an hour training, and that would include you know, 20 minutes of brain stimulation and an hour of physiotherapy. That might be robotics, virtual reality, traditional therapy. So it's really um, what I would say high level therapy, cutting edge stuff, but it's done in a training environment um, under supervision of qualified therapist, obviously. Um, so it can be slower in how it's delivered, but you're getting some great treatment. And we're seeing great outcomes um, with some of our patients. You know, people that, um, it, it astounds me that uh, we have patients come through who were not off offered upper limb therapy through our public health system because they were deemed to be not suitable for rehabilitation. Their arm was placed in a sling. They come to us, we tested the pathway still intact. It's still intact. We start offering therapy that they're informed that the pathway's there, that, you know, that, that there is still a connection between the brain and the hand. And just knowing that information sort of encourages them to go, actually, maybe there's a chance that my arm will start to work. And then we start to work into you know, doing a lot of this therapy and we start to see things come back. So um, yeah, I'm kind of excited for our clinic and where it's going, but we have a, we're in a very unique place being a teaching facility and being able to offer that direct to the community. Thank you, Brenton. So it's really, really exciting to hear all your recovery stories for you know, the team in Australia helping so many um, patients out there. So thank you both of you for sharing your insights and also educating all of us on TMS applications. And we look forward to all the future research publications that are coming up on uh, neuromodulation. And um, so just bearing mind of time. So thank you all also for joining us. So we hope that you have enjoyed and learned from the experts on today's panel. So before we conclude the session today, we would like to bring attention to this poster presentation. And so we have a QR code that leads you to a feedback form where you will also find a section to fill your name in for the certificate that will be issued for your participation if you want one. So we will also be prepping for our next webinar series in the fall. So that will have the theme of assessment and preventive technologies for rehabilitation. And we appreciate all your feedback. So thank you for your time. For now, goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in September for our next webinar series. Thanks, Brenton. Thanks, Bruce.